we begin our second session today with Doris McCraw. She's going to speak on the Cripple Creek Volcano, a 35 million year disaster. She's a writer and actor whose specialty is history and historical characters. She's a graduate of <coughs> Illinois Wesleyan University with a BA in social work and criminology. She has always been fascinated by people, their history, and how they contribute to the society of their times. Her favorite pastimes are research, reading, writing, and performing. For over 10 years, Doris has researched the early history of the, this is really early history, of the Pikes Peak, <laughs> Pikes Peak region for, 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 for performances. I'm going to watch this one really carefully, okay? And writing. She has worked as a speaker, actor, counselor, playwright, and author of short stories, articles, and poetry. Among her popular historical character interpretations are Helen Hunt Jackson and Catherine Lee Bates. She's a presenter for Colorado Humanities Chautauqua program as Helen Hunt Jackson and is currently the editor of the National Women Writing in the West newsletter. Thank you. One correction, I'm no longer the editor, but I had a lot of fun. <laughs> Cripple Creek Volcano. How many of you have heard of it? Yay! <laughs> you just read it, right? <laughs> you may wonder what a 35 million plus year disaster has to do with today. And I am going to venture to say that there is not a single person in this room that has not been touched in some way or other by that event. The volcano itself occurred approximately 35, 40 million years ago in what they call the 39-mile volcanic area. It took up part of Teller County, Park County. That whole area was very active volcanically. To give you a sort of a reference, the fluorescent fossil beds were also, their, their creation was started during this same time period. What is unique about Cripple Creek is despite all the volcanic activity, and up in Fair Play, yes, there was some mineral found, Breckenridge mineral found, but it wasn't until you got to Cripple Creek that mineral of any substance or quantity was found. And when I speak of mineral, I'm primarily talking about gold and silver. Prior to the finding of gold in the Cripple Creek area, it probably looked something like this. And by the way, that in the background is Mount Pisgah. So if you can imagine, this was probably what it looked like. There is some indication that Fremont came through that general area when he was surveying and going through the area. In 1870, there were, the area started opening up to, I can't call them homesteaders, they were actually squatters because the area was not surveyed for homesteading. And some of the first people up there were the Welties. And during this whole time, people would stop and look to see, is there any gold here? Is there any, any way for me to get rich? Prospectors tend to be very solitary people. They love the hunt once they find it. OK. I don't know that they're terribly interested in the wealth, although it's nice. But they enjoy the prospecting. Then in, um, shortly after the Welties had started squatting in that area, and there were a number of other uh, ranchers up in that general area, the Hayden Survey came through. And the Hayden Survey went into the Cripple Creek area, the western part of Pikes Peak, primarily to serve that survey that area for homesteading. And as you can see, Ranching was a big deal back then. In 1874, the Womack family bought the wealthy squatters' rights for $500, and their son Bob 
built a second homestead at the end of a ravine that the Hayden survey called Poverty Gulch. By 1880, ranching was very well established. And by 1884, a lot of those squatter's rights and homesteading rights were bought up, and a company called the Pikes Peak Land and Cattle Company settled into that area. It was done by some uh, purchasers here. The owner was a gentleman from back east by the name of um, Ellsworth. In 1885, Philip Ellsworth came out to look at his holdings in the Cripple Creek area. And he was very upset. He said that he had been, um, that they'd, he'd been lied to. And so he went to sell his property and he sold it to Horace Bennett and Julius Myers, who hired a gentleman by the name of Carr, and they created the um, Broken Box Ranch and the Hausman Cattle and Land Company. And the Bennett and Myers bought the area bought for 5,000 cash down and $20,000 to be paid if and when they could. <laughs> yeah. And during this whole time, this area was, con people were still continuing to come into the area to see, you know, to prospect. The general story goes that people would find a little bit, but, or they would drill or blast holes and stop like two feet short of this big, wonderful load of gold. Well, let me explain. One of the unique things about Cripple Creek, as one, proctor, one prospector said, Cripple Creek is a geological freak. <laughs> because you see, the gold in Cripple Creek doesn't look like the rest of the gold that most people were used to. When the volcano, and there were some stories that said that the volcano itself was one big gigantic explosion. But the general consensus today is that it was a series of explosions over as much as about two million years. And during those various explosions, the gold salts would go down into the faults, etc. The gold in Cripple Creek is gray. Did you know that? Yep, it's gray. It's not gold, it's gray. <coughs> well, two things, probably three things, stopped the finding of gold in the Cripple Creek area. Number one, it really didn't look like the gold that most people knew. Number two, Womack, who kept insisting there was gold up there, didn't have the very best of reputation when it comes to his veracity. <laughs> Number three, even if they had found it, economically it would have not been profitable to mine gold in Cripple Creek up until about, 19, about 1890. At that time, technology had advanced enough and the prices to um, mine the gold out had come down enough that it would have become profitable to do that. In her book, Cripple Creek Days, Mabel Barbie Lee is quoted as saying that she overheard Stratton say, too much money's not good for any man. I have too much and it's not good for me. A hundred grand is enough for anybody who wants to be free from bitterness and heartache that comes with great wealth. A couple of things were going on in the mining industry, one of which is the 1872 mining law, which is, has the apex clause, which basically means that it allows you to follow your vein down and even if it intersects and crosses somebody else's, it's still yours. Well, as an example of some of the mines and minings and how things worked up there, I'm going to use the example of the Portland mind. There's a 
pretty interesting books out there, but in a nutshell, Jimmy Burns and um, Jimmy Doyle, I think. I just lost the name. Doyle and Burns were friends, and they were bound and determined to find a mine in Cripple Creek. Now, Stratton had already made his millions. He found the first one, and he is credited with being the first millionaire in the Cripple Creek area. Most of the wealth, or the, the greatest amount, was found in an area around Victor, which is called Battle Mountain. Well, Doyle and Burns would, went up into the dark of night, and they were digging their little holes, and they found what assayed out to be a pretty substantial um, finding of gold. Unfortunately, all that area had been claimed. So they proceeded to check with the various surveyors, check with the maps, etc., and they found a tenth of an acre that was not claimed. So they, in the dark of night, th as the story goes, they put their claim out. Well, obviously, they were going to run into a bunch of other people's claims because they've only got a tenth of an acre. So they basically girded themselves for their legal battles because of the Apex Law. They were able to buy out some, win some other court battles. The end result was the mine, which they named the Portland Mine, because both the gentlemen were from Maine, and I believe that that was probably the reason for it, became the richest mine in the region. So now Doyle and Burns had lots of money. Doyle became the mayor of Victor. Burns became the president of the company. And the two of them started going at each other's throats, <laughs> to put it in a concise way. To the point that at one point, Doyle went and filed suit against Burns in Iowa, which is where the company was registered. Of course, Burns fought back. Doyle, while still mayor of Victor, was put in the El Paso County Jail and spent a fair amount of time there. Fascinating story there. I don't have time to go into it today. The result was essentially um, Doyle ended up being ousted. Burns ended up making even more money, stayed on as president. However, there were a lot of other people underneath Irving Halbert, uh, Doyle, uh, Burns' son-in-law, were not necessarily on speaking terms with Burns. <coughs> so despite all the wealth and all the work that they had gone through to get this mine and to make lots of money, it ended up tearing up a friendship and basically kind of creating some real issues. During the heyday of the Cripple Creek gold rush, by 1900, there uh, looked to be 10 established towns and approximately 32,000 people in that region. As with any enterprise, you have your haves and your have-nots. You have your owners and you have your workers. In late 1895, I believe, there was a labor war and labor won the war in the Cripple Creek area. The workers won the right to an eight-hour day, $3 a day. But by 1903, 1904, labor was losing some of its hold, and there was again a labor war in that region. A lot of lives were lost, and labor lost. Now, Cripple Creek, which probably would not even exist had they not found gold up in that area, was the county seat. Victor 
was always known as the City of Mines because most of the mines are located close to the town of Victor. As a matter of fact, the town of Victor had a gold mine right in the center of town. The Woods brothers, who basically founded the town of Victor, they were one of the few who put money back into the town. They built a lovely um, place for the um, workers to go afterwards. And also Colorado Springs, which was founded in Palmer by Palmer in 71 and Colorado City in 1859. All four of those towns were affected by that volcano and the gold that was located in Cripple Creek. The town of Cripple Creek, they were so busy putting up buildings and putting all their money into their mines that the homes that they were building were very flimsy. You had two fires right back to back in Cripple Creek. Victor, although they did a little bit better, they also had a fire. The fire in Victor, actually in both towns, the buildings were built of bricks and things were much better. Colorado City was a beneficiary in that they were supplying supplies to the, not only initially it was set up to build, uh, provide supplies to the South Park uh, Leadville Fair Play area, and then when the Cripple Creek Gold was found, they just built upon that and continued. Colorado Springs, which Palmer founded basically as a cultural and resort tourism town, all of a sudden you had all these millionaires from Cripple Creek who were building their homes down here on Woods Avenue, which was, by the way, named for the Woods Brothers. Uh, Stratton, who revamped the uh, streetcar system who bought bicycles for all the washerwomen. So I've figured that one out. You have Jimmy Burns, who built the Burns Theater, which unfortunately was lost to us in the 70s. When that money started coming into Colorado Springs, all of a sudden the, chain, the face of Colorado Springs started changing. Cripple Creek, which if you will look, this is the somewhat of the area, Depression Caldera. This is actually from the lip looking down into Cripple Creek. When the mines started slowing down in the um, 18, I'm sorry, 1920s, 30s, 40s, these would have been some of the homes, buildings, the area, in order to survive, started building on its history and became very tourist oriented. This is a picture of the Cripple Creek area today. Now we will go into a little bit of the environmental and I will do this very quickly. What you see up at the top are some of the tailings from the mine now. In 1900, they built a chlorination mill in the area but area just south of Colorado City. In 1905, they built a cyanide mill, which is probably one of the cheapest, and they say most ecologically, um, safe of the ways to extract gold from the rock. Unfortunately, the process leaves by, behind a lot of arsenic minerals, things that are very hazardous. This is the way uh, Cripple Creek looked in 1900. This is a picture of the area that is taken up with the Cripple Creek District. This is the mine today. It is an open pit mine. Now, down here in the lower corner is the town of Victor. Up in the upper corner is the town of Cripple Creek. Give you an idea of the immensity of this particular mine. I will say to you, and their website, uh, ccvgoldmining.com, is an, a wealth of information about what's going on up there. They have, in order to mine there, the state of Colorado requires the mine 
to supply a bond that will pay for reclamation when they are done. At this point, the uh, bond is just short of 100 million. So when they finish mining and they expect to, uh, I think they just put in another request to extend out to 2025. Um, the, all of this land, their reclamation plan is to turn it back to farming and grazing. In the meantime, they also help pay for the infrastructure of the town of Victor. They support baseball teams. They support 4-H. They, they try to do a lot to give back to that community. Thank you very much. We're now going to hear about mini disasters. I wonder what a mini disaster is. I guess we're going to find out from Nancy Prince, who received an MS in geology from the University of Colorado Denver with a thesis, a thesis work on the dinosaur trackways in Pinon Canyon, Colorado. She has managed large environmental cleanup projects and is currently employed as a geologist for the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. She grew up in southern Colorado in the mini dust bowl of the 1950s remembering that as the end of farm life for her struggling family. Nancy is a frequent presenter at History and Genealog Genealogy Interest Groups telling stories of pioneer families in territorial Colorado. Nancy. Well, I hope Maurice White doesn't mind if I borrow the most recent album cover, but Earth, Wind, and Fire was just too good to pass up. His astrological signs are helping me. My first awareness of the impact of natural events, we could call them catastrophes after listening to Mike this morning, um, on human life was the mini Dust Bowl of the 1950s. Not as long or as intense as the 30s, but it had a big impact on me. My early years were spent on a farm in Crowley County. I still remember my dad stringing a line from the house out to the barn so my mom could go out and feed the cows. And after the storm, my brother and I climbed up onto the uh, back of a dune to get up on top of the chicken coop. Well, by the time Eisenhower came to tour the damage, we'd already moved to Pueblo so that daddy could get a steady job at the steel mill. But I was one of the kids that was standing cheering as Ike's motorcade uh, drove past Pleasant View School on Highway 50 East. And that trip was also an occasion for um, continuing discussions of the Frying Pan Arkansas Project, which was designed to bring water across the Continental Divide to help the farmers. I think some of that water now belongs to the city of Aurora. That's a disaster of another kind, not the topic for today. Um, my grandmother grew up near this spot in southeastern Colorado, where six people died in a sudden blizzard. Because it was spring, um, a lot of the kids didn't have coats, and they weren't prepared for the cold, and the bus driver made the mistake of leaving the bus to go find help. So when I was a kid growing up out in the country, it was like every time snow was forecast, stay with the bus, watch out for each other, keep moving, and bundle together for body warmth. So with this background in disasters, I really sympathize with my ancestors' stories of grasshoppers and fires as they settled on the Colorado Plains during territorial days. Um, this is my great-grandfather's record, handwritten record. He was an immigrant from Bohemia, so that's why some of the words are a little strange. But uh, when they first moved to Colorado in 1865, grasshoppers destroyed their crops. And that homestead still stands on Overton Road. It was partially destroyed by a house fire in 1873, along with their naturalization and homestead papers. But while I was doing the research for the family, I kept running into a lot of other stories about how these events had impacted other people. So I'm kind of playing the Ira Glass role today, um, this American Life themes here. Um, it's more about the kind of impact, not the kind of uh, event. In the territorial days, in 1860 and 1870 census, the uh, uh, total population was approximately the same. Ten years later, there were about five times that many people, but ne nearly as many as there are to get in the way of things today. 
One of the first natural disasters that I found in the Rocky Mountain News was about the death of three miners, their mule and a dog, in a forest fire near Central City. They were burned beyond recognition, and, but the people did find a few of their um, effects that they were taken into town to see if anyone could figure out who the men were. And over the next few years, other fires were reported in South Park and along the South Platte, but there's no report of loss of damage to structures or humans. By contrast, the Heyman Fire 10 years ago this month was in roughly the same area as some of those fires, and the estimates are the total was about $160 million, that's one that I read, and that about half of that was lost to homes and structures. Now down to the earth part of the title. One Sunday morning in 1870, people in Pueblo and Fort Reynolds, a little bit to the east, uh, were rudely awakened by their bed shaking and by loud noise. Of course, the newspaper editor said he wasn't smart enough to know whether or not that was an earthquake. Well, I think there's just a little bit of boosterism going on there. He didn't want anybody to be worried about moving to Pueblo. There were other smaller tremors in the state in the early 1800s, or the late 1800s. The strongest quake reported ever in Colorado was on November 8, 1882. Um, some plaster was knocked off the ceiling of buildings in um, Boulder and in Cheyenne, and a bolt broke in the power building in Denver, causing a power outage as well. And you'll see that that one ISO seismic line extends all the way to Salt Lake City. The map was compiled by consultants in 1980 based on newspaper reports and diary accounts, and the evidence suggests that the epicenter was about 20 miles west of Fort Collins and that this was a magnitude 6.6 .6 event. So uh, the people looking at this nowadays have put it into one of the models, and they say that if the same earthquake were to happen in the same place today, the damage would be about $2.6 billion, and that's partly because of the number of people that are in the area, and um, our infrastructure just isn't built to handle that kind of a shock. Now, usually when we see the auroras, we just think of the beauty associated with that. But in the um, 1800s, there were um, telegraph lines that burst into flames because of the overloads, and now we have to worry about what kind of uh, power in interruptions like that are doing to our telecommunications network. So, if you're the one... In 1857, soldiers were sent to Utah to deal with the Mormon insurrection. In northern Wyoming, they suffered huge losses to men and livestock because it was a really bad winter. The following spring, an emergency relief caravan was led by Captain Marcy and Colonel Loring. They left New Mexico, headed to Utah by way of Bridger Pass in Wyoming, following the old Cherokee and Trapper's Trail. When they got to a spot on the divide just east of Monument Hill on April 29th, it was a gorgeous spring day. We've all seen that, you know, birds were singing, the grass was growing. I thought, well, this is a good place. We're just going to camp and rest and, you know, feed the cattle. Well, about sundown, the weather started changing, the wind started to blow, and it started to snow. The blizzard lasted for three days. Uh, 200 or so uh, soldiers and teamsters hunkered down in their bedrolls and tents. All but one teamster named Michael Fagan. Um, they discovered him uh, frozen to death just outside the camp. And because the ground was um, too hard to dig, they just buried him in a shallow grave and put large white rocks up for protection. And this was a landmark that was noted uh, frequently by the uh, early gold rush parties as they went past. The final straw. Uncle Dick Wooten was born in Virginia in 1816. He came west to seek adventure when he was 20. He first trapped and traded across much of the west and tried ranching and farming at various locations in southern Colorado. You can see all those little yellow stars at different places where he's been, where he talks about having lived. He even had one of the early taverns in Auraria, reportedly serving Taos Lightning to the um, early gold seekers on the first Christmas in 1858. That was also about the same time he rented part of his building to William Byers as the first home for the Rocky Mountain News. Well, 1860, he thought, well, you know, this town isn't growing. It's not going anywhere. So he packed up and moved to a ranch on Fountain Creek that's about three miles south of Pinion. But he also had a house in Pueblo. And he, 
I really think he planned to stay because he was appointed county commissioner when the territory was established. And he was a young father, he had just survived the loss of two wives in a row, and had small children, so I think he was going to stay there. But events in the spring and summer of 1864 changed his mind. Um, devastating flood, a few weeks later, um, big hailstorm. So he packed up and he moved to south of Trinidad. And some of you might know more about Wooten as being the guy that built the um, toll road over the pass to take advantage of the traffic between um, southern Colorado and northern New Mexico. And he did stay there for the rest of his life. And gradual change, that's another theme. After the Civil War, the cattle empires began with the cattle drives. Think Wyatt Earp and Lonesome Dove. Here you see the Goodnight Loving Trail through eastern Colorado. Grazing the large herds was a logical step in the evolution of the business. Investors from Europe and back east saw opportunity for easy money and became instant cowboys put a little bit money down on the cows, find some cheap cowboy labor to raise them. Oh yeah, and you can do that on free government land. What a deal. The well-funded outfits often used open range that had not been homesteaded. The employees would file the homestead patents in critical areas so that the outfit would control the streams and the good pasture. Some of the local stockmen either worked directly for the investors or folks like Iliff up north or Thatcher and Bloom down south. Others ran smaller but still substantial outfits of their own. And each one of those stars and the names are on the 1885 topo map I'm using as a base there. I just highlighted them so you could read them. <coughs> one of the ranches was the Diamond Tail Ranch, which is now part of the Chico Basin Ranch. And I think that my great-grandfather is one of the cowboys in this picture. But you can see how open the range was. So in order to protect their holdings, some of the ranchers would fence in large areas. And one stockman in eastern El Paso County fenced in 20 sections, almost 13,000 acres in 1878. Only problem was he didn't have legal title to any of that, so the government made him take it down. Well, from the very beginning of the uh, Western development, weather had been a problem for anyone that relied on stock for their business adventures. And you can see here that poor Mr. Majors, well, he was pretty proud. Only 25 head of cattle was lost in one year, so that one season, so that wasn't too bad. But as the cattle empires grew, the grasslands became overgrazed, and there were drought conditions um, different years in the early 1880s, and that also stressed the range. And even as early as the 1880s, there are reports of them using um, grain to supplement the grazing for feed. Um, but there were a number of widespread blizzards in the winters of 1885 through 1888. And you see here one loss of human life, and some of you might have read or heard about the um, children's blizzard of 1888 also. Well, that also impacted the um, herds, and this is one depiction of what life was like for the poor livestock. And th that die-off was actually the end of the large cattle empires. And who remembers the commercial, don't fool Mother Nature? Well, the Easterners that came out here to, for the gold rush and to set up those little towns, Auraria and Denver, um, they were used to big rivers. And so they took a look at Cherry Creek and South Platte and thought, hmm, they're just dry streams. So, you know, this was a big deal when there was actually water in one of them. And they didn't listen when the natives and the trappers told them that, you know, those could be raging rivers. That, ah. But just in case, we're going to do a little bit of engineering. We're going to put, we'll build in the dry creek bed, but we'll put the places on stilts. We'll be fine. <laughs> that was until they woke up on the night in May. Um, if you were in low-lying area, there was water lapping around your toes. Um, all in all, 19 people along Plum Creek, Cherry Creek, and the Platte died. Businesses, including the Rocky Mountain News Office, were swept downstream along with homes and cattle. It's really hard to come up with an estimate of loss on this one um, because uh, you know, it did cover such a geographic area and there wasn't a lot of communication back then. But I saw one um, guy said he thought it was $18 million in 19, 1864 dollars. And technology. 
The twin scourges for farmers were hail and grasshoppers. And I don't want to count the 150 grasshoppers on a square foot. Um, house fires were a constant worry, too, for the city dwellers especially. The hail damaged crops, livestock, roads, even rock outcrops. The one they're talking about here at Hardscrabble, we just saw a picture of that. Um, note that some of these descriptions look like they came out of Thursday morning's Gazette, including the um, stones piled two feet high on Pikes Peak. Um, the Army, you know, part of their mission, you know, in um, helping um, make the West safe for settlers was to um, be able to understand the weather and what the weather would do to the troop movement. So they put a weather station in Denver in 1872 and one two years later on the top of Pikes Peak. Um, you can see here that in this the month of June for three different years. Um, 1875, the lowest recorded temperature and the highest wind. 1876 had the highest rainfall. Well, um, really good at reporting and we're getting a lot better at forecasting. I live near Wasson High, and my son was calling me as he was watching the clouds swirl on his smartphone, um, telling me which way the storm was headed. But even with the warning, I still lost to the most of the leaves on my old maple trees. You know, we've got technology, but we still don't know how to stop the hail. There's been more success in controlling the grasshopper problem, though. Um, the Rocky Mountain locust infestations in 1863 and 65, and again between 1873 and 75, um, caused significant loss. Um, the species died out in 1903, no one knows exactly why. But their grasshopper cousins are controlled now by broadcasting bait aimed at the early part of the life cycle before the insects can develop resistant exoskeletons. Technology has had the most impact on the house and city fires. Um, you can see here that um, open flame for either warmth or light and um, flammable buildings were not a very good combination. Um, also, there was complaint that they didn't have the infrastructure in the new counties, new towns, as uh, Dory mentioned. Um, now we've got a wide range of firefighting chemicals, we've got infrastructure, and we also have technology that reaches far beyond the simple bu bucket brigade and steam engine. The list of towns and cities that suffered significant damage is long, and um, some of them had more than one fire, and I probably left your favorite one off this list. This is just a few that I pulled quickly. And the photo is the Antlers Hotel in Colorado Springs in 1898. But of course, we all know the civic response to a disaster like that is to spend money. So just a year later, we got the new ladder truck on parade. And another thing that happens is you come up with new ordinances, trying to make sure it never happens again. Following the 1864 fire is when um, Denver put in an ordinance requiring brick construction. Now, before we had flying saucers to be afraid of, people were afraid of lions and bears. And the newspapers like to make light of the over-exaggerated fear for human safety. It's not that there wasn't real reason to be concerned, especially for the cattle. Um, but you still wonder why Mr. Jameson dropped his hat and his gun and his ax when he ran away. <laughs> then there are mixed blessings. And Dory touched on this a little bit at the end of her talk. Um, the early settlers definitely were attracted by the financial potential in the region. Um, other resources have caught people's eye in the past and continue to do so today. I ran across this one while I was looking for Mr. Wooten, and here we see that um, they were interested in uh, coal and petroleum near Trinidad in 1866, and actually the first oil well in Colorado was drilled near Florence in 1862, where the second oldest oil producing um, state in the Union. And then disasters can be in the eye of the beholder. In 1857, one of my great uncles was teamster on a campaign against the Arapaho, led by Major Sedgwick and Colonel Sumner. There's a report by Uncle Billy that a tornado on July 4th disrupted their camp near Greeley. Um, I wasn't able to find too many other articles about tornadoes. I didn't go as uh, more 
most recent as the 1891 that happened here in Colorado Springs. I think that most of the tornadoes that did happen were in places where there was no one to see what was going on. And you can see here also that um, even grasshoppers could be made fun of if you were in the right mood. The Baptist church talk was going to be on impartial providence. And a baseball game between the ranch hands from Pueblo and Colorado Springs almost came to an abrupt end due to an ill-timed dust storm. I guess your feelings about the potential disaster depends on how you feel about baseball and how much you paid for your ticket. <laughs> and some storms just make for pretty pictures. From looking at the rest of today's schedule, I think we'll hear how some of these 19th century events have set the stage for 20th and 21st century policies and infrastructure. I don't mean to make light of some of the personal tragedies I described, but I do hope that my talk was almost as funky as Maurice White's music. Thanks.